is the Parks Mall in Arlington, Texas. There's nothing specifically awesome about this mall, it just happens to be the mall I grew up around. In fact, there were three malls I shopped at as a kid, and uh, this was one of them. Another one was called the Forum 303 Mall, which was torn down years ago. The other one was called the Six Flags Mall, and it too was also torn down years ago. Of course, there are plenty of other malls in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, like the Hewlett Mall or the Galleria Dallas. I never visited these as a kid. Uh, we also had the Tandy Center Mall, which I've talked about before, but it was also demolished a few years ago. So the only thing special about the Parks Mall is that it's the only one of my three childhood malls that remains standing today. Which makes it more interesting to talk about because we can compare what it is like today versus in the 1980s. One problem that has plagued me with making a video on this topic is the sheer lack of multimedia like pictures and video of the insides of these electronic stores and shopping malls and, and places that I wanted to talk about. And it's not for a lack of trying. In fact, when I was much younger, uh, on many occasions, I tried to take a video camera or even a still camera into various electronic stores or shopping malls. And you know what always happened? That's right, security always told me to leave. In fact, one time they even confiscated the film out of my camera. These places were extremely paranoid about people taking pictures inside of their stores, and I never quite figured out why. I actually asked a security guard one time as he was escorting me out exactly what the reason was, and his, he said it was because they didn't want competitors to come in and document the prices on their products. And, you know, I countered that with like, well, couldn't they just walk in with a piece of paper and a pencil and write them down? Or better yet, just grab the catalog that you give away to pretty much every customer that comes in for free, which clearly documents all of the prices of all of the products. And uh, I wasn't really given a good answer to that question, but uh, I don't think that that was the real reason. I think it was an excuse. I'm not quite sure what the real reason was for not allowing photographs, but whatever it was, it wasn't just me. Uh, basically, uh, nobody was able to take pictures in these places. And well, you can kind of get away with it now because everybody carries a camera in their pocket. Um, there just isn't hardly any video or pictures to be found from the 1980s or 90s of the inside of these places. But I do have this. Uh, this is a little window into the past of the Parks Mall. Uh, this is a layout of the mall during the 1980s. And so we're going to take a little virtual look at the various electronic stores in the mall at that time. Uh, granted, most of these stores uh, are stores that sell clothing, shoes, jewelry, or whatever. Stuff that nerds like me really don't care about. Uh, but, but there were a number of electronics and otherwise nerd-worthy stores for me to shop at during that time. Uh, for example, we had Babbage's. Now, for those that don't remember, Babbage's was a software store. Now, um, clearly this photo is from a later time. As you can see, they're selling games like Halo and whatnot. But in the 1980s, this is where we bought software for our Commodores, Apples, Ataris, among other things. The next store is Camelot Music. Uh, this is where we went to shop for our cassette tapes and later compact discs. Electronics Boutique was another software store we had here in the mall. In fact, I think this photo here was actually taken at the Parks Mall because this is the exact layout of the one that we had. Anyway, again, uh, this is where we would shop for Commodore or Nintendo games. Uh, later on, they actually started putting Amigas up on display for people to play with and uh, check out the games. Next, we had Musicland. Uh, this was a competitor to Camelot. Um, again, we bought cassettes and compact discs in here. And don't forget Radio Shack. And while I'm sure everyone remembers Radio Shack, some younger people might not remember Radio Shack the way I do. In the 1980s, they were a store full of cool electronic gadgets, uh, many of which you just couldn't find anywhere else, like this talking clock, which I've had since the 1980s. It's 5.17 p.m. Or Roby Jr., which I've also had since I was a kid. And don't forget the Armatron. Um, and while this is not my original model, it's uh, pretty much exactly the same. But this is also the place you'd find portable computers like these, or even pocket computers when nobody else was selling them at the time. Um, one of my Christmas rituals was to look through the Radio Shack catalog and circle the things that I wanted for Christmas and give it to my grandparents, and they'd usually buy me one or two things that I'd ask for. And that is how I came to be in possession of this Roby Jr., which uh, this was a product that was only available at Radio Shack, and um, I've actually had this in my possession since I was 12 years old, and I did, in fact, get this for Christmas. A lot of Radio Shack products were rebranded Japanese products that simply weren't for sale in the USA under any other brand name, uh, such as the Pocket Computers or even the Model 100. And some products, like this keyboard, were uh, also available for sale in other stores under the Casio brand name. 
However, uh, the Radio Shack that existed in the last decade or so before their bankruptcy didn't hold much resemblance to the Radio Shack I grew up with in the 1980s. Um, anyway, back to the Parks Mall. So, so far I've shown five of my favorite stores that are now gone, but there's a lot more. Uh, we actually had this store here called the AT&T Store. Now, the funny thing about the AT&T Store is you might be thinking, well, we still have those now, but we don't, at least not the kind of AT&T store we had back in the 1980s. If you walked into that store, what you would have seen are landline telephones like these. And uh, they actually had a variety of different types of telephones, hundreds of them actually, uh, designer telephones, Garfield telephones, uh, telephones that looked like they were antiques, you know, things like that. But they were all uh, landline telephones. Even the cordless phones they had were, were still designed to work off of a landline. They didn't sell cell phones in the store. Uh, you could get cell phones down at Radio Shack, uh, but not at the AT&T store. And so uh, the interesting thing is I have looked and looked and looked all over the internet and I cannot find a single photograph showing what the inside of the AT&T store looked like uh, during the 1980s because when you search for it, all you find are pictures of the modern AT&T store. So I'd love to be able to show you what it looked like. Um, it was actually a pretty cool place for nerds to go. We also had a tilt located here. Uh, this was an arcade, very similar to the type of arcade you could see in the movie War Games. And while tilt is still in business in some locations, uh, the one here in the mall has been gone for decades. Next up on the list, we had a Ritz camera. Uh, this was the store that carried everything you might need for photography. And as you can imagine with the invention of the digital camera, this place went the way of Kodak. We also had a KB toy store located here, and you might think, gee, why would you care about a toy store? <laughs> well, besides toys, they also sold quite a bit of Nintendo and Sega Genesis stuff here. And while not inside the mall, we had a Toys R Us right outside the mall that shared the same parking lot. So while not shown on this map, I always considered it part of the mall. And uh, Toys R Us carried not only game consoles, but actual computers like Commodore and Atari. Uh, plus you could find neat things there like the Fisher Price Pixel camera. And of course, both KB Toys and Toys R Us are both gone today. We also had two bookstores, B. Dalton Books and Walden Books, and I used to go into these stores to find books on programming as well as my favorite monthly computer magazines like Ahoy or Computes Gazette. And while we still do have a bookstore in the mall today, it's a Barnes & Noble instead. And the last thing on the map I wanted to mention is Sears. Uh, they used to have quite a large electronics department. In fact, this exact Sears location is where my dad took me and my brother and bought us new computers of which I picked out a Commodore 128D. In fact, I still remember my dad having to drive around here to the back to pick up the computers. Now, that being said, Sears just recently went out of business as you can see that it's <laughs> all boarded up. Um, however, the electronics department has been gone for a long, long time already. And there's one more store I wanted to mention at the mall, and uh, that's Suncoast Motion Picture Company. And it doesn't show up on this map because uh, the store wasn't added until about a year after this map was printed. But uh, if I remember correctly, it was right up here. And uh, this was the place I shopped to find all of my favorite movies and TV shows on VHS tape and eventually even Laserdisc. And so out of all of these fun stores in the mall, literally none of these exist today. And what's worse, it isn't like they were replaced by competitors. There are literally no electronic stores, music or video stores in the mall at all, unless you count GameStop, which doesn't exactly have a bright future. <laughs> As such, uh, for the last couple of decades, there hasn't been much of any good reason for me to even go there. All that remains are clothing stores and all of the other things that us nerds just don't care about. But it's not just the mall. My parents bought my first VIC-20 at a store called Best, uh, which has been gone for decades now. And uh, some of my computer equipment also came from Service Merchandise, which was part of that Forum 303 mall that I said was demolished years ago. We had a computer store here called Computer City, which has uh, been gone since the 1990s. And don't forget Circuit City, <laughs> although I think they sort of deserve to die after trying to unleash that horrible DivX format on the world. CompUSA was another great computer store that's been gone for a long time, and another store that was actually in the Parks Mall during the 1990s was Sharper Image. And they had a lot of neat electronics gadgets, but uh, also disappeared a long time ago. Of course, everyone knows Blockbuster Video. Now, I can't count how many videos I rented from them, uh, and about 20 years ago, me and a friend of mine put a live fish in their return box. Uh, we had just caught it out on the lake, and it was about the size of a video cassette, so it fit just fine. You know, we filmed the crime so we could laugh at it for decades, and well, you know, here we are still laughing at that. Um, anyway, 
Uh, moving along, we also had this really cool store called Incredible Universe. Now, unfortunately, they didn't last more than a year or so and went out of business. And uh, the building that they were in was bought out by Fry's Electronics, who occupied it up until just recently. And I'm sure everyone has heard the news by now that Fry's is officially out of business, putting one of the last nails in the coffin of electronic stores. And, you know, it wasn't just large electronic stores like these. Uh, there were lots of smaller, independently operated electronic stores all over the country. Too many to count, in fact, that uh, have all suffered the same fate. So what happened to these stores? Why did they all die out over the last 20 years? You know, admittedly, some of the earlier ones that died out in the 80s or 90s were probably due to bad business practices. <laughs> However, I think all of them that died in the last 20 years or so can be attributed to three specific factors. The first and possibly most important problem was the invention of the smartphone. To illustrate exactly what I'm talking about, let's take a look at this old Radio Shack catalog from 1985 and imagine how these products would sell today. Oh look, VCRs, who needs that? Oh look, uh, portable stereo systems, <laughs> who needs that when you have a smartphone in your pocket? Portable cassette recorders for dictation, who needs that? Portable cassette players for your music, again, who needs that? Blank media, more home stereo stuff? Oh look, cassette players for your car stereo, who needs that? CB radios for communicating on the road, who needs that? Ooh, landline telephones, who uses those anymore? Even cordless phones, <laughs> um, more portable stereos, alarm clocks, does anyone still use those? Even more alarm clocks, including some fancy talking clock. Portable televisions, I mean, who needs that when you can watch anything you want from a device in your pocket? Yet even more clocks. Uh, pages and pages of calculators. I mean, <laughs> who needs one of these when everyone has one in their pocket already? Ooh, and a pocket pager to keep you in touch with family. Who needs that? Oh, and automatic telephone answering systems. Yeah, does anyone still have one of these? And um, portable computers, but why bother when everybody carries a supercomputer in their pocket? <laughs> or even pocket computers, kind of pointless these days. And that's just the Radio Shack catalog, but don't forget some of the other important things that disappeared, like video cameras. I mean, sure, some people still buy them for professional use, but the average citizen has no need of such a thing. Uh, same goes for still cameras, no need for those. Uh, portable GPS systems sort of went away for the most part, since everyone has one in their pocket now. But it's not just the electronics devices that went away, but also all of the supporting products. Uh, for example, why would an electronics store um, have aisles and aisles worth of space for cassettes or CDs or even videotapes or DVDs, for example? Um, and nobody buys their computer software from a shelf anymore. I mean, we download it from the App Store. Imagine taking the menu at Taco Bell and just blotting out 80% of the items on that menu and saying that nobody was ever going to buy those again. And what's worse is there would be no increase in sales of the remaining items on the menu either. And that would reduce Taco Bell from a major player in the food industry to just a small niche in a food truck or something. I mean, it would destroy their business. And that's essentially what the smartphone has done to electronic stores. But um, it's not the only cause. The second nail in the coffin is, of course, the dramatic cost reduction of electronics. I mean, just as an example, uh, take a look at this ad from 2001 here. A decent living room sized TV could cost as much as $3,000. And if you wanted a plasma TV around this time, the cost was as high as $14,000. Um, you either had to be wealthy or put it on a payment plan. Uh, today, you can go into Best Buy and buy a similar sized TV for a little over 400 bucks. So, I mean, let's imagine the profit margin on such an item is 10%, uh, considered average these days. Um, that means that they make $40 for selling you a nice living room TV, as opposed to $300 that they would have made back in the 90s. And if you account for inflation, it would really be more like $500. So, with most of the electronics items, the profit margin was literally 10 times higher back in the 90s than it is today. Now, this is most likely one of the reasons they have ridiculous prices on things like HDMI cables and try to scam every buyer with some kind of extended warranty because there isn't enough profit to be made on the electronics items themselves. And that brings us to the last nail in the coffin, which is online shopping, and more specifically eBay and Amazon. I mean, why drive to the store and sit through traffic just to look at a smaller selection of stuff than what you can find online? Um, instead, you can order from the convenience of your smartphone wherever you happen to be. Probably pay a little bit less for the product and have it at your doorstep in a day or two. And so these three things are why I believe the electronic stores of yesterday went out of business and they're never coming back. And the sad part about this is there's a culture that has been essentially lost to time. Um, it's impossible to recreate the shopping experience that we had uh, back in the 1980s. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to give up my smartphone or online shopping, but I do miss 
being able to go into a variety of stores and look at all the gadgets and gizmos that they had on the shelf and um, trying to decide, you know, which was the one I just absolutely couldn't live without, um, you know, but uh, that's all, that's all history these days. And, and I don't think people, unless they were born in that era, I don't think people will ever be able to experience it again, which is uh, somewhat unfortunate. But anyway, that wraps it up for this episode. So um, as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.